I like us to talk about this. Women who pastor, women who preach in a church are a disgrace, and they openly reflect opposition to the clear command of the Word of God. As in all the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the churches. They're not permitted to speak. It's disgraceful for a woman to speak. It might be shocking to you to know this, but in a survey conducted in 2017, about 80% of Americans are comfortable with a female pastor. 62% of practicing Christians are open to women pastors. 27% of pastors across this country are women. This is an explosion. In 1960, 2% of clergy were women. The women's movement has basically just erupted in the church. And the last frontier for the movement is the evangelical church. The last frontier to fall victim to the rebellion of feminism along with cultural Marxism. Perhaps women pastors and women preachers are the most obvious evidence of churches rebelling against the Bible. Okay, just to be clear, Pastor Makachu is someone I respect a lot, so I'm not in any way just starting this video to contradict him or to say he's wrong. But what I want to point out in this video is that taking the scripture in that light or in that context or in that interpretation can be very dangerous. And the other scripture that most people use to discredit or cancel women preachers, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 to 14, he says, I also want the women to dress modestly. If we go down to verse 11, he says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man now he says i he didn't say the lord is going to break heaven loose if a woman does this he says i now the evidence that this is contextual and a tradition for culture and organization in the church is that when you look at first corinthians chapter 11 from verse 2 he says i praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as i pass them Onto you. Remember the traditions I pass them on to you. And a typical one of those traditions too is that every woman who prays or prophesies, verse 5, with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. So one of the traditions he's telling them is that our culture and tradition that we have here is that women cover their heads during services. Now the good question you should ask everybody who is pushing against women preachers is do they also encourage their women to cover their heads in their churches? Because we should not just select traditions that suit us or select the traditions that we're going to speak against just because we want to perhaps prove something or just because we want to have a particular stand that makes us stand out. Just to prove more the point that it was about tradition and not about commandment, look at that verse 5. He says, But every woman who prays or prophesies, wait, wait a minute, did, is he contradicting himself? Didn't he just say that the woman is supposed to remain silent and not speak? So, how on earth is she praying and above all prophesying? Who is she prophesying to? To herself in her room or she's prophesying to the church? Obviously, he's talking about church meetings. So, the woman is prophesying in the church so this alone still in the same chapter tells you that paul was addressing traditional issues things of a uh, legalistic nature to set order an organization but he wasn't giving a commandment like this is god's commandment that if you don't cover your head the lord will not hear your prayer i mean how many women watching this has god not answered your prayer because you prayed without covering your head the main reason why we have this conflict today in the body of christ is that we confuse that the scripture actually has two parts you know there are the commandments commandments of God that have consequences if we do not respect them. These are things that God has explicitly or openly spoken about them. And then there are also the other things that are kind of neutral or in and of themselves have no much consequence. And so God doesn't even address them. So those are now the parts that fall under tradition. So we have commandments and we have traditions. A typical example of tradition is when we look at circumcision. Okay. In Acts chapter 16, we'll see that Paul actually circumcised Timothy. But what exactly does it say? Acts chapter 16, then he came to Deb and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Verse 3, Paul wanted to have him go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews 
who were in the region, for they knew that his father was Greek. So it's important to note that Paul circumcised Timothy, not because circumcision was a commandment in salvation, but because of the people who were there that were gatekeepers and that could criticize him for not doing so. The evidence is that he goes on not to circumcise Titus, and this becomes a problem. So he now has to set the record straight in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 18 downwards, where he says, But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk, and so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called wise circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called wise uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Remember, circumcision was a tradition in Judaism. And so he is saying traditions it's up to you okay if you want to keep traditions that's fine but don't elevate traditions like jesus said the problem is that the pharisees had elevated the laws of men the traditions above the commandments of god the simple evidence of places where we see paul dealing with traditions is from first corinthians chapter 7. up until then paul is hitting hard on god's commandments and instructions about purity and holiness and when he gets to chapter 7 you start hearing him say things like this now about virgins i have no command from the law but I give judgment as one by whom the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. And pretty much from there, you see Paul start addressing a lot of things that were not really issues of concern in and of themselves like consequences were not really there but just for the sake of other in the church it was important that he gives a stand and if you move on to first corinthians chapter 8 chapter 9 10 11 he addresses all those things food that is given to idols and all of that and then he comes to chapter 14 where he now talks about other in the church and that's where he comes with the scripture where he says he does not permit for a woman to preach so that was in a context of a tradition of setting other in the church look at exactly what the scripture says first Corinthians chapter 14 he says verse 33 for God is not a God of disorder but of peace as in all the congregations of the Lord's people women should remain silent in the churches they are not allowed to speak but must be in submission as the law says the law remember he's talking about the law the tradition so what we learn from here is that the central thing about traditions is just about the principle okay so we have principles okay then principles can be expressed through symbols and those symbols become traditions like where i come from in west africa a principle that we have here is that we respect men okay there's a principle that men should be respected especially to the fathers of the house so one of the symbolic ways that that was represented is that they say when the woman kills a fowl and cooks a fowl the gizzard is reserved for the man or for the fathers of the house so a woman is not allowed to eat that so only men did eat gizzard but looking at present times that becomes a question if a woman is living alone and she cooks her fowl is she supposed to you know take the gizzard and throw it away or she's supposed to walk over to her neighbor who is a man and say well you know i'm a woman and according to the tradition i cannot eat the gizzard so take my gizzard and eat as a woman would you do that you see so it wasn't about the symbolism the gizzard is a symbol the real principle is about respect so gizzard or no gizzard you should still respect the man so sitting quiet in church or talking in church the principle is that women should adorn themselves with submission and reverence and respect that is what paul was actually trying to point out otherwise he wouldn't even be allowing them to pray or prophesy in church Circumcision was a symbol of God's principle of his covenant with Abraham. So the symbol in and of itself has no power. What really matters is the principle of the covenant. And that's why Paul went on to say that he's ready to follow as many symbols as possible, but by all means, he remains with the principle of actually saving souls because that is what really matters. And you can see that when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, he says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. So he goes on to say that wherever he found himself, he found himself with the Jews who think even though you are saved, you still need circumcision. He did the circumcision just so that they don't hinder the real objective of the principle that is out. It's for souls to be saved. If it's with the Gentiles who don't value anything about circumcision, he leaves that. So he is saying that we should focus on principles and not on traditions. We should focus on God's commandments and not on tradition. So the real principles and commandment is here is that we should go out there and win souls. A woman can preach, a woman can win souls, a woman can teach 
if we're against women preaching, then what about the Sunday schools? Should the women also drop that? What about the deaconesses and the elders? Should we also let them out? What about the powerful examples that we see in scripture? As a matter of fact, you may not know it, but one of the first evangelists in the New Testament is actually a woman, and that is in the person of the Samaritan woman. So we see that Jesus goes and preaches to the Samaritan woman. So she receives the gospel and she doesn't keep it to herself, but she goes on to evangelize and draw others to come and hear the gospel that Jesus was preaching. And what does the Bible tell us that a lot more people received the word and believed and indeed said this was Christ the Messiah thanks to the woman's testimony and the Bible tells us the testimonies of Jesus are the spirit of prophecy. So the woman was technically the first evangelist and she drew many to, to Christ. So both from the Old Testament and the New Testament from the story of Esther to Deborah to the woman of the issue of blood and the Samaritan woman and Phoebe we actually see a great manifestation of faith and the power of God through many women. So we can elevate a tradition to a commandment to silence technically 50% of our power that we really need to bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. So I would like to know what you think about this in the comments below. Some people say the scriptures simply men, women are not supposed to be senior pastors. It can be associate pastors or deaconesses or elders. But tell me what you think down below. And if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Hit that bell so you don't miss our next video. So thank you so much for watching and a big shout out to our patrons for helping us create content like this. You too can support the channel. The link is down below. So until the next video, stay blessed.